In this unit of study, we are going to learn about the rise of the Roman Republic and its fall as a republic by 31 BC. Just like the previous units, we're going to first look at geography here with Italy. Italy, like Greece, is another geographical region shaped by mountains with the Alps in the north as to guard against northern invasion and the Apennines in the middle, 1,000 kilometers long and up to 3,000 meters high, like a spine down the center of the Italian peninsula, commonly referred to as the boot. The Apennines provided a shield to the west coast from northeast winds and as a source of Swiss rivers embedded in rich valleys. Earthquakes and volcanoes had supplied the lava of enrichment of the soil on the plains and in the valleys at the Apennines. Upland lakes, basins, and long enclosed valleys were created by the Earth's movement, which isolated early communities of the Italian peninsula as they did on mainland Greece. Viewing the map on ancient Italy, in the north lies the Po River Valley, known as the Cisipline Gaul until 42 BC, with its rich plain that provided wheat, millet, vineyards, and good grazing for sheep, with the nearby upland regions adding a source of hardwood timber. As we move toward the northeast, a good harbor region around the port of Genoa was extremely important in ancient times for the export of sheep, hides, and wood, and honey from the upland areas. These products were then traded for wine and olive oil from other districts of Italy. South of Rome are the two great plains of Latium and Campania, west of the Apennine Mountains. In ancient times, both were areas of surplus in agricultural products, such as wine, olive oil, and cereals. Campania was also noted for its location of the volcano, Mount Vesuvius, and the ancient Roman towns of Pompeii and Herculeum. Both will be destroyed by massive eruptions. Most of the earliest towns in the regions were founded by the Greeks along the coastline during the 8th through the 6th century BC. South of Campania in lies the southeast region of the Apennines, which is the mountainous region, which is thin soil and marshes, but it does provide for good harbors, notably Brindisi. Sicily. The triangular-shaped island of Sicily is separated from Italy by the Straits of Messina, which is the narrowest part and is only two miles wide. Sicily mountains are the home of Mount Etna, the region's nearly 11,000 feet high volcano. Most importantly, the island's location in the center of the Mediterranean Sea made Italy a meeting place of ancient nations, Greeks, Carthaginians, and of course, Romans. Geographical differences. Unquestionably, geographical conditions shape the differences in the historical development of both Italy and Greece. More specifically, Italy was not entangled and divided geographically as was Greece, and thus it was easier to establish a united state from Rome. The Romans remained an Agrian society throughout most of their history. Central location in the Mediterranean brought Italy into closer relations with the barbarous peoples of Gaul, Spain, and North Africa. Greece had a distinct advantage here with its numerous islands in the Aegean Sea while facing a more civilized nations of the East. Rome as a city was also influenced by geography. Its location some 18 miles inland created a safe haven from pirates in the situation on the left bank of the Tiber River on the Latium Plain, encouraged agriculture. In addition, Rome was surrounded by seven hills, which gave the Romans an advantage in defensive warfare. Furthermore, its central location on the Italian peninsula made Rome suitable for north-south trade, enhanced by the best fording opportunity when crossing the Tiber River. Even with all these advantages, Rome still lacked good harbors, were the best ones situated in the south and southwest of Italy. Ostia, the harbor of Rome, required constant dredging because of the swiftness of the Tiber River. Additionally, the river itself was only suited for small boats, and consequently, Rome never became a great commercial or industrial city. To further add to such difficulties, the immediate neighborhood surrounding Rome was unhealthy swampland, which had to be drained before it could be made habitable. In short, Rome's central location on the Italian peninsula was its greatest advantage an advantage that later led to extensive road construction projects, thus enabling Rome to maintain military control of Italy. The Italians. 
The Italians were an Indo-European people who spoke a language closely related to both Greek and the Celtic tongues of Western Europe. They entered Italy through the Alpine passes, and we assume that they mingled with local inhabitants, which make them a mixed people, as were the Greeks. Major groupings in the primary locations are as follows. The Umbrians in the northeast, Sabines and Equins, Upper Tiber Valley, the Samnites in southern Apennines, and Latins south of the Tiber River. Colonization, 750 to 550 BC. The Phoenicians settled on the coast of North Africa in southern Spain and on the islands of Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, and Malta. In the 7th century BC, the Carthaginians, their capital was Carthage in modern Tunisia and North Africa, assumed leadership of all of Phoenicia, or as the Romans said, Punic colonies, and eventually built a large empire. The Carthaginian navy dominated the western half of the Mediterranean Sea, and their empire was the largest state in the region during the period of Alexander the Great. The Greeks, who began to colonize the west toward the middle of the 8th century, and they settled in the southern coast of Italy and as far north as Naples, where they were checked by the Etruscans. Others settled Sicily and also launched the city of Syracuse, later made famous in the 3rd century BC for its artists and scientists, as well as its wealth and military power. Additional Greek expansionists colonized southern France at Nicilla, or known as today as Marseille, and further along the Riviera. From these Greeks, the Romans derived their alphabet, a number of their religious concepts, and much of their art and philosophy. The Etruscans probably originated in Asia Minor, and the Etruscans settled north of the Tiber River during the 9th and 8th century BC and expanded their presence through the colonization and conquest, while leaving behind such name as Etruria, modern Tuscany. The Etruscans united their cities in a league which for 400 years controlled the Italian coast from the Bay of Naples to the Gulf of Genoa, and inland to the Po Valley as far north as the Alps. They even occupied the shores of Sardinia and Corsica. Etruscan cities were built on hilltops and surrounded by massive walls, contained arch gates, paved streets, and underground drains. Their inscriptions on the tomb somewhat resembled Greek letters. However, to this day, no key to the Etruscan language has ever been discovered. From their artifacts, weaponry, pottery, and tombs, Historians know that their culture showed similarities to the cultures of the peoples of Asia Minor. Specific examples include the use of the round arch, vases with Greek designs, their skillful work in iron, bronze, and gold, and a gloomy religion concerned with the worship of malignant spirits. The extension of Etruscan power over Latin tribes also included Rome, where soon after 600 BC, Etruscan kings began to rule the Latin population. Although the Romans prospered economically, they resented the foreign militaristic rule of the Etruscans and a widespread rebellion of Latin tribes. The Roman population expelled Tarquin the Proud, the last Etruscan king in 509 BC. Early Rome. Romulus and Remus were the twin sons of Rhea, Silvia, and Mars. They were together with their mother cast into the Tiber. Their brothers were miraculously rescued by a she-wolf. The wolf reared the twins together with her cubs underneath a fig tree, the Romulus ficus, and after a few years they were found by a shepherd, Faustulus, to raise. When they reached maturity, they killed Aemilius, the brother of their grandfather, and built a settlement on the Palatine Hill. During a quarrel where Remus mocked the height of the walls, Romulus slew Remus and became the sole ruler of the new Rome which he had the name after himself. To enlarge his empire, he allowed exiles and refugees, homicides and runaway slaves to populate the area. The shortage of women he saw by stealing Sabine women, whom he invited to a festival. After a few wars, the Sabines agreed to accept Romulus as their king. Upon his death, he was taken to the heavens by his father Mars. He is later revered as the god Quinarius, where he would say, go and tell the Romans that they have a will by Rome will be capital of the world. 
Let them learn to be soldiers. Let them know and teach their children that no power on earth can stand against Roman arms. Early Rome. The influence of the Etruscans is evidenced in the characteristic dress, the toga of the Romans. The Romans' knowledge of the arch and vault, their practice of divination, seeking to foretell future events, and the cruel amusement of the gladiatorial games, and the use of the fascists, that's what you see to the left, an axe surrounded by a bundle of rods, as a symbol of power and rule, a part of the Etruscan process of conquering and occupation. They transformed small villages into cities, and this can be viewed as the fathers of urbanization of central and northern Italy. The Latins. The Latins gave up their tribal lifestyle and established small city-states, much like the early inhabitants of Greece. They united in a league against the Etruscans, had yearly festivals where they celebrated athletic games and offered sacrifices to their chief god, Jupiter. One of the cities that belonged to the League was Rome. We do not know exactly when Rome was founded. What we do know, however, is that it was an Italic people who started the city, probably no later than 1000 BC, with most historians now believing that the traditional date of 735 BC was the invention of the Roman writers. Eternal Rome began as a Latin settlement on the Palatine Hill, just south of the Tiber, and another sediment by the Sabines opposite of the Palatine community on Quirinal Hill. These rival settlers eventually formed one state, but to form a common marketplace between the hills and a steep rock called the pa Capital Tine and form their common citadel. In the course of time, the inhabitants of the other five hills of Rome joined the earlier two groups and collectively they constructed a boundary, this so-called Servian Wall, to fortify and protect their combined settlements. One conquest followed another, such that by the end of the 6th century BC, the territories dominated by the inhabitants of Rome probably was as extensive as the whole Latin plain, which spanned from the Apennines to the Mediterranean Sea. As mentioned earlier, the agrarian aristocracy of Latium finally expelled the Etruscan king, Tarquinius Superbus, in 509 BC. They established what was called the Roman Republic, which from a political perspective was an oligarch republic. Soon after this history-defining event, the remaining Etruscans, with their monarchy now overthrown, were permanently driven from Latium. The Roman Republic, 509 to 264 BC. Kings ruled Rome from 600 to 509 BC. The king fulfilled the roles of high priest of the state religion, the supreme judge, and the commander in chief of the army. To guarantee his power, the concept of imperium, or the right to command, legitimized his regal position. The early kings used a purple border toga an ivory throne, and the fascists, a symbol of the king's power, to flog and behead offenders. A republic was formed after the overthrow of their last king. A republic is a government in which citizens have the right to vote to choose their leaders. The right to vote and other political rights were not shared by all citizens. An oligarch republic arose based on the division of the population into two classes, the patricians and the plebeians. After the overthrow of the monarchs, the patricians dominated the chief political institutions of the Republic. Balanced government by 275 BC of a monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. The councils are responsible for calling and presiding over the meetings of the Senate. The councils would be responsible for publishing the first Roman newspaper after entering office, and only the councils may introduce new Roman laws. The imperator may introduce only martial laws. Only the councils may call for the division of the Senate, a vote, and only the councils may call for elections. No council may be removed from office before the end of his term, and each council has the right of veto, which is Latin for I forbid. All proposed legislation must be put into writing prior to the division of the Senate, and after their term, a council secures the title and status of consular, allowing him two senatorial votes. 
This is not a cumulative, of course. Praetor. This appointment is only open to senators. The praetor is responsible to the Senate and people to ensure that all Rome's laws are obeyed under the terms directed in the Lex Romana. He shall act as judge in disputes involving Romans, whether internal or external. He served as the consul suffocus. If the council is unable to keep participating, he could lead armies. As Rome expanded into the Mediterranean, additional praetors were needed to govern the provinces. And as these provinces continued to grow, proconsuls and propurators were developed and sent out as governors. Being an ex-consul or praetor was a requirement. And once again, Rome proved how to solve an immediate problem with a practical solution. Dictators would hold absolute power to make laws and command the army for only the length of six months. They were chosen by the council and elected by the, the Senate in times of crisis. Cincinnatus was looked upon as the ideal dictator. In 458 BC, he defeated Rome's army and returned back to farming. He was only dictator for two weeks. Other offices. Quaestors assisted councils and, and praetors in financial affairs. The Delius supervised the public games and were in charge of the grain supply for Rome, which was very, very important. And the censors, they all had to look at the assessment of the population for tax purposes, military service, and office holding. The Roman Senate. The Senate was aristocratic. Membership was for life. This would bring continuity and stability to the government and the Senate was exclusively made up from the patrician class and consisted of about 300 members, including former consuls and other senators appointed by the consuls. The Senate's power laid grounded in its ability to effectively veto any decision reached by the assembly and thus was the dominant force in the Republic's government. SPQR, which would became the symbol, would stand for Senatus Populus K. Romanus, the Senate and the people of Rome. The Roman Army. The Roman Army functioned as a political role, organized by classes based on wealth. They elected a chief magistrate and passed laws, few stationary laws, most of them government was based on the magistrate's authority. The Centrate Assembly, membership was based on wealth and age, and most important assembly of them all. They elected censors and magistrates and declared war, passed some laws. They're the highest courts of appeals for cases involving capital punishment. And the army was probably Roman's strongest defense card. The basic unit of the early Roman armies was the phalanx, a formation of about 8,000 foot soldiers who went into battle several lines deep. And the phalanx was divided into centuries, each one consisting of 100 men. Soldiers who could afford expensive armor and arms fought in the front lines, while the others brought up the rear. Combatants who could afford horses and armor were understandably drawn from the aristocratic class. Even so, the Romans were weak in cavalry and usually relied on their allies to provide mounted contingents. The Servian Infantry, a 6th century organization by Servius Tullus, was divided into property classes, with the wealthiest having the best swords and spears were protected by helmets, round shields, and greaves, and breastplates made of bronze. To the poor citizens who served in the time of emergency, they were equipped by the state. Additionally, there were also artisans who repaired siege machines and other military equipment. The legion consisting of 3,600 men replaced a much larger phalanx and the composition of the legions changed from centuries of 100 to 60 men, called maniples, meaning a handful. These new maniples of 60 men can move more quickly and thus take better advantage of changing battle conditions. Allies were also called upon to aid Rome in the case of war and were commanded by prefects who were Roman officers. The military. The army was probably Rome's strongest defense card. The basic unit of the early Roman armies was the Pallax, a formation of about 8,000 foot soldiers who went into battle several lines deep. The Pallax was divided into centuries, and each one consisting of 100 men. Soldiers who could afford expensive armor and arms fought in the front lines, while the others brought up the rear. 
Combatants, who could afford horses and armor, were understandably drawn from the aristocratic classes. Even so, the Romans were weak in cavalry and usually relied on their allies to provide mounted contingents. The Servian infantry, a 6th century organization by Servius Tullus, was divided into property classes with the wealthiest having the best swords and spears. They were protected by bronze helmets, round shields and greaves, and breastplates. To the Poor citizens serving in a time of emergency, they were equipped by the state. Additionally, they were also artisans who repaired siege machines and other military equipment. The legion consisted of 3,600 men and replaced a much larger phalanx, and the composition of the legions changed from centuries of 100 to 60 men called maniples, meaning a handful. These new maniples of 60 men could move quickly and thus take better advantage of the changing battle conditions. Allies who were called upon to aid Rome in case of war were commanded by prefects or prefecti, who were Roman officers. Social organizations. The basic unit of the early Latin society was the familia, the household or the family. Legally, this included the father, mother, and their dependents. The household retainers paid servants such as tutors for the children, slaves, and property. The father or the pater familias exercised supreme jurisdiction called a tria potestas, or paternal authority over the family. This authority, which lasted until the patriarch's death, included the power to punish with such harsh sentiments as banishment, slavery, and even death within traditional laws. The father owned all the property of the family and held absolute power as trustee. As long as the father lived, his sons could not own or have legal control over family property. Furthermore, the youth's father was his natural judge and could privately disinherit his offspring and sentence him to death. While his father was alive, an adult son could do nothing without his father's consent. He could not sign a contract, free a slave, draw up a will, or choose a career. The birth position of the son had no effect on his status in the family, as it did later under primogeniture in medieval times. Although tradition encouraged younger sons to respect the priority of the eldest, this eldest male offspring did not enjoy extra legal privileges. The patricians were an oligarch republic arose based on the division of the population into two classes, the patricians and the plebeian. The class of the patricians came from the aristocratic families, descendants of old clan leaders who held good sized estates, or they were individuals who descended from the property families who were full citizens. They monopolized the seats in the Senate and the officers in the magistracy. The plebeians were the great majority of the population and were only partial citizens. In the early days of the Republic, they were not even allowed to serve in the army, but could vote, but not hold government offices, could not intermarry with the patricians, but were allowed to make legal contracts and marry members of their own class. Nevertheless, they enjoyed some political rights and they were allowed to amass wealth in their endeavors as small farmers, craftsmen, and traders. The struggle of the orders, 494 BC. The plebeians withdrew from the Senate. Afraid of the defense of the state, the patricians are forced to compromise. Two new officials were known as the tribunes of the plebs. Officials responsible for protecting plebeians against arrest by patrician magistrates and for making proposals before the Council of the Plebs. The Council of the Plebs was a popular assembly. The tribunes became responsible for conveying and placing proposals before it. If adopted, these measures would become plebiscita. It is the opinion of the plebs, binding only on the plebeians, not the patricians. The assembly elected the councils and other officials and approved or rejected legislative submitted to it by the councils and the Senate. Both patricians and plebeians could participate in the assembly, but the patricians, though fewer in number, had control over the assembly through the voting process. This voting process was based on the army's organization into centuries. The 98 patrician centuries of the assembly, although with fewer constituents per century held sway over 95 plebeian centuries, even though they had a much larger constituency per voting unit on the following reasons. Each century had one vote, irrespective of the size of the union. Obviously, this clever voting system allowed the patricians to outvote the plebeians in all issues coming before the assembly. 
Desenviri, ten men. The Desenviris, these ten councils, formed the legal code, which was binding to both plebeians and patricians, which would become the twelve tables that were published into the law. The twelve tables were twelve bronze tablets with the written law around 450 BC and no longer based strictly on the interpretation of judges. These laws covered private property, family, divorce, marriage, theft, enforcement of debt, injuries, and other codes. This is the foundation of Western civilization, civil and criminal law. Cornelian law finally permitted legal marriages between plebeians and patricians. As with most Roman traditions, there was a formal method of doing things with written documentation to record the event. Marriage was no exception, and even the couple's engagement was laid out in writing and signed by witnesses. Engagement rings were common, even in Roman times, and the girl would wear such a ring on the third finger on her left hand as a symbol, as is the case today. The Roman marriage contract stated that the reason for the marriage was to fulfill the couple's desire to unite and have children. The naming of the children was also traditional and inherited to most regular say. If the child was a boy, he was then given three names. His first name, his personal name, like Marcus, his second name, the clan name, like Tullius, and his third name, his family name, Cicero. The example above, of course, of course, was why Marcus Tullius Cicero was named. This was the case if the child was a boy and came from the nobility, and any girls produced were only given a personal and clan name. In 367, the Licinian Section laws were made into law. In 367, called for one council, now must be a plebeian. And in 342, it said now both councils can be plebeian. What this is showing is the plebeians are beginning to gain more and more force and po political power in the Roman Republic. Ortesian Law, 287 BC was the tribal assembly of plebeians was permitted to make laws binding now for the whole community, also did not need the approval of the Senate. The results, what we see on this, Romans used compromise, not revolutions. Theoretically, all Roman citizens were equal under the law. New senatorial aristocracy. The rise of the nobiles is a group formed by intermarriage of wealthy patricians and wealthy plebeians, which came to dominate the political offices. The Roman Republic, therefore, is not becoming democratic. The effects. After much change, the Roman state became a republic, and in theory, the people were supreme. Unfortunately, this was not the case. Even after massive reforms, status due to birth and wealth still heavily influenced Roman society. The Senate was the most influential political body, dominated by patricians and wealthy plebeians. Like Sparta, Rome confided political and military leadership to the patricians, had a disciplined and highly organized army, and made the training of brave and obedient soldiers a chief goal of education. However, Rome did differ from Sparta in some very significant aspects. There was no constraint military preparedness, plebeians rose in the rank, and there was an effort to help the poorer classes. Therefore, Rome's lower classes were not on the verge of revolt, as were Sparta's helots. Nevertheless, the power of the people in the assemblies was limited by the magistrates. Their rights to criticize the government was stifled, and their effort to address important issues at public meetings was non-existent. These meetings were actually reduced to the simple yes-no vote. And furthermore, only a group vote by ward century or tribe was used. As a result, the individual was deprived of his influence of governmental affairs, and consequently, Rome never attained even the limited democracy of Athens. The final form of government during the period of the Roman Republic roughly parallels the American branches of executive, legislative, and judicial as illustra illustrated in this lecture. And what a lot of Americans do not know, we are not a democracy. We are a republic, and our founding fathers looked to Rome, not Athens, in forming our government. The Roman conquest of Italy. 
While the new Roman government was assuming its final form, Rome was also expanding her rule over the Italian peninsula. This first stage of expansion to 265 BC concluded with the Romans dominating the other Latin towns, the Etruscans, and the half-barbarian tribes of the Apennines. After the expulsion of the Etruscan kings, a league of Latin allies formed and challenged Roman leadership in Latium. In 493 BC, the Romans established an alliance with the Latin communities, which provided a common defense of Latium. The historian Livy provided a detailed account of Rome's war with her neighbors, mostly as a tool to teach the moral values and virtues that made Rome great. Tenacity, duty, courage, and especially discipline. Revolt of Latium, 340 to 338 BC. Latium revolted against Rome in 340 BC, who resented Rome's dominance. Rome crushed the revolt and established complete supremacy in Latium. The Samnite Wars. Rome fought the Samnites, a hill people from the central Apennines. The defeat of the Samnites gave Rome control over a greater part of Italy and contact with the Greeks. The Phyric War. The Greek cities of Magna Graecia in the south resisted Roman influence and summoned the Greek warrior Phyrus, king of Epirus and cousin of Alexander the Great from northwestern Greece. In a campaign between 281 and 270 BC, Pyrrhus twice defeated the Romans, but did not take advantage of his victories, nor did he capture Rome. Pyrrhus lost some of his best men in these two successes and declared, another such victory and I am lost, hence the name Pyrrhic Victory. Pyrrhus then crossed over to Sicily to give aid to his countrymen against the Carthaginians, but Rome, was, make, was moving into Greek territory so quickly that upon his return to mainland Italy, Pyrrhus suffered a crushing defeat. As a result, he returned to Greece. Tertium fell, and Rome established her rule over southern Italy. One could only speculate, not a good idea for a historian, that if Pyrrhus had won, Italy might have become a Greek land under Hellenistic kings. Nope. Here we encounter one of those proverbial pivotal moments of history. The final results. After conquering Italy, Rome developed a confederation. They allowed Latins to have full citizenship. The communities were free to run their local affairs, but had to provide soldiers for Rome. Allies could also attain Roman citizenship. The keys to Rome's success. First, diplomacy, to negotiate and bring peace. Second, strike when threatened by a petitional follow-up. And third, never quit until victory was achieved. Colonies. Romans and Latins settled the new areas outside of Latium. Romans established fortified towns and all strategic built roads to connect military and a communication network. Hence, all roads lead to Rome. This helped in trade and the mobilization of the army. There is a saying that all roads lead to Rome, and by 100 BC, this was becoming true. As we can see, the roads that are linking all the way from Palermo, remember it's only a two mile stretch in the Straits of Messina from the boot of Italy to Rome, and all the way to the northern part of Genoa, and areas that would later on become Venice. Now we turn our attention to Roman's conquest of the Mediterranean, 264 to 133 BC. Carthage and the struggle with Carthage. Carthage's army is three times larger. They have 500 naval ships, great wealth, and through trade and nubita mercenaries. Rome, no navy, but they captured a Carthaginian vessel and introduced the gangplank and built up their army to 500,000 soldiers. And warfare, unlike for Carthage, was a Roman specialty. By 265 BC, Rome was confident of her strength, and after that time became involved in a series of wars known as the Punic Wars with Carthage, a great maritime empire from the northern part of Africa to the Strait of Gibraltar. The initial clash began in 264 BC and was caused by the Roman jealousy over Carthaginian expansion into Italy. 
Carthage controlled the western part of the island of Sicily and was threatening the Greek city-states of Syracuse and Messana on the eastern coast. The Greek king of Syracuse appealed to Rome for help. War broke out, which lasted from 264 to 241 BC. With his first Punic War being won by Rome, a subsequent peace treaty specified that first, Carthage had to recognize the sovereignty of Syracuse over eastern Sicily. Second, Carthage had to cede western Sicily to Rome. And three, Carthage had to pay an indemnity of 3,200 talents, about $2 million worth of 1957 silver prices. Other than this treaty itself, perhaps the most important consequences of the Rome war was the Rome emerged as a Mediterranean power rather than remaining a local Italian ruler. The Second Punic War. The Carthaginians were humiliated and the Romans became more greedy and arrogant, which eventually contributed to the outbreak of the Second Punic War of 218 to 201 BC. By this time, the Carthaginians had built up their strength in Spain for an overland invasion led by the Carthaginian general Hannibal, only 27 years of age at the start of this conflict. Hannibal had an army of veterans, both infantry and cavalry, besides a number of awe-inspiring elephants. The strenuous trek over the Alps cost Hannibal half his original army and pack animals, and after a five-month march. As he entered the Po Valley in northern Italy, he had only 25,000 troops left, but was still victorious in various skirmishes and battles against the two Roman consuls, Scipio and Separonius. Because of these early victories, the Gallic tribes joined Hannibal and furnished him much needed soldiers for his dwindling army. Regardless, by the end of 218 BC, Hannibal controlled all of northern Italy. In the following year, Hannibal invaded central Italy through the Apennine Passes, and in the Battle of Lake Trasimenus in 217, he annihilated a force of some 40,000 Romans. It was one of the worst military disasters in all Roman history. But instead of attacking Rome with its strong fortified walls, Hannibal headed south. Some historians have suggested, however, that he did so because of lack of basic siege equipment and machines. The Roman dictator, Fabius Ferracosus, refused to fight the enemy and was dubbed the Delayer. The Romans nevertheless kept their army close on the heels of Hannibal's troops. Fabius' strategy was to wear down Hannibal's mercenaries, in particular the Gauls. This strategy cost the Romans and their allies dearly because the Punic army looted farms and villages and literally lived off the land. At the end of the year, two new Roman consuls, Aemius Paulus and Terentius Varro, went into action during the month of August in 216 BC. The Romans engaged Hannibal at Cannae, and their forces consisted of four oversized legions of approximately 50,000 infantry and 6,000 cavalry, while the Carthaginians only had 35,000 infantry and 10,000 cavalry. While opinions differ, Modern military strengths consider this battle to have been a decisive victory for Hannibal. Rome's losses amounted to a staggering 40,000 men, including the consuls Paulius, two quaestars, 29 military tribunes, 80 senators, and several proconsuls and procurators. Additionally, Hannibal took some 10,000 Roman prisoners, leaving less than 10,000 Roman troops who escaped from the battlefield. With Hannibal's reputedly lost only 5,700 men, it was butchery and disaster for Rome. The Battle of Zama. After Cannae, Hannibal's officers urged him to march on Rome itself. He refused and instead began searching for a negotiated peace, which never came. Even though the Greeks of Syracuse and Philip V of Macedon became Hannibal's allies, this did not discourage the Romans, and they began to rebuild their army, financing this major effort through an increase in taxes from their citizens. In the meantime, not all had gone well for Hannibal. The Scipio family defeated his brother Hasdrubal II in Spain, and the Nubians in North Africa revolted against Carthage. And finally, in 211 BC, Claudius Marcellus took Syracuse and brought all of Sicily under Roman control again. 
Hannibal then met his Waterloo in Scipio Africanus, son of the old general who had fought the earlier war in Spain. In the fall of 202 BC, Scipio finally caught up with Hannibal and the two armies faced each other at Zama. This decisive battle was a comedy of errors for Hannibal. His elephants ran out of control. His cavalry was driven from the battlefield and his new recruits panicked and ran, leaving the Carthaginian army surrounded. The Romans wasted little time and particularly destroyed the entire Carthaginian force, with Hannibal barely escaping with his life. Carthage sued for peace and asked Hannibal to conduct the final negotiations, results which were disastrous and planted the seed for further conflict. Major elements of the peace treaty included the following. Carthaginians gave up Spain and all their territories. They surrendered all their warships, seven and saved 10 trimarines. They paid a huge indemnity of 10,000 talents and Carthage became a satellite of Rome. Finally, there was peace into the Mediterranean. The Third Punic War and the final war between Rome and Carthage. After the decisive defeat in the Battle of Zama, Carthage slowly began to rebuild both military and commercial capabilities, much to the chagrin of Rome and its Senate. The belligerent senator and censor, Cato, began to stir up sentiment for another Punic War, ending one speech exhorting, Delante is Carthago, meaning Carthage must be destroyed. The inevitable Third Punic War was characterized by a direct attack on Carthage, which had been preparing for such an attack, and had resolved to perish in their city's defenses. Carthage held out for three years, but finally the starving cities and citizens was stormed in the spring of 146 BC. For seven days, the legionnaires fought street by street, house by house, till from a population of half a million or more, only 50,000 were left to surrender, only to be sold into slavery. After the capture of Carthage, the Roman Senate ordered the city burn, the site plowed under, and the earth to be salted. Now Africa becomes a Roman province, and the senators of Rome received large landed estates. This map, of course, depicts Rome's conquest of Carthage. Next, we're going to move into the areas of Greece and to the parts of Asia Minor, where Rome will move east, going against Carthage's allies. Although victorious in the Punic Wars, these events brought Rome into conflicts with the Eastern Mediterranean and also paid way for her eventual world dominion. For Philip V of Macedonia's alliance with Carthage in the Second Punic War and his plot to divide Egypt with the king of Syria, Rome sent an army to the east to punish him. The result was the Roman conquest of Greece in Asia Minor and the establishment of the Protectorate of Egypt. When Corinth rebelled, it is going to be destroyed in 146 BC. This conquest of the Hellenistic East led to the introduction of Oriental ideas and customs in Roman culture. And the king of Pergam just on his deathbed deeded his kingdom to Rome. The nature of Roman imperialism. The empire was built in three stages. First, there was Italy, and then there was the Punic Wars, and then the domination of the Hellenistic kingdoms in Eastern Mediterranean. Rome liked to think of themselves as declaring war for defensive reasons. Remember, strike first. And Rome was opportunistic and their expansion showed cruelty as we saw in Carthage and Corinth. But there was also part of the Roman ideals, never quit and never get up. Because they had no master plan, but they took the opportunities that were presented to them, they were able to expand their empire. Social and economic revolution. Unquestionably, the Punic Wars caused a social and economic revolution in the Roman Republic during the third and second centuries BC and can be synthesized by the following statements. First, a marked rise in slavery due to the capture and sale of prisoners of war. Second, the decline of the small farmer as a result of the establishment of the plantation system and conquered areas and the influx of cheap grain from the provinces. Third, a growth of a helpless city mob composed of impoverished farmers and workers displaced by slave labor. 
four, the appearance of a middle class comprising of merchants, moneylenders, and publicans, or men who held government contracts to operate mines, build roads, or collect taxes, and finally five, an increase in luxurious living and vulgar displays, because these and other fundamental problems were not adequately addressed by Roman authorities, Rome inevitably headed towards the decline of her republic. Society and culture in the Roman Republic. Religion, the pantheon of the gods, the goddess Juno for women, the goddess Minerva for craftsmen, Jupiter was the chief god, Mars was the god of war. And they adopted Greek gods, but just gave them different names. Hermes for Mercury, Jupiter for Zeus. Roman religious practices included a collection of priests to carry out rituals correctly in the adaptation of certain Greek gods like Apollo. Dependent on the gods for everything, correct ritual was important. To get one's reward, a college of priests were formed, called pontiffs, to carry them out. The right relationship with the gods was achieved by accurate performance of the rituals and the festivals. The pontificus maximus, the chief pontiff, was the head of the state religious. Julius Caesar was the first. They would choose six to ten girls to be the Vestal Virgins that had to keep the fire lit, and that is the temple of the Vestal Virgins you see before you. The College of Augurs would interpret the signs or auspices, warnings. Imperians would take the reading of the auspices to tell if the decision was a good one or not. Education, the importance of rhetoric. There was no public education. Boys' basic elements of farming, trained to be good soldiers, learn traditions of the state through the heroes of their Roman ancestors, and be acquainted with public affairs. Girl skills were to have a good house, be a good housewife and mother, and the upper class of both were taught to read. With the influx of Greek culture, rhetoric and philosophy becomes important to the upper class males. Through rhetoric, a male can rise to public life through elections and winning lawsuits. Learning to speak Greek became important, and so private tutors or Greek slaves were used, and private schools were formed as well. Grammaticus Secondary School taught literature, logic, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. The growth of slavery. Slave laws were harsh. Murder of the master resulted in all of the slaves being executed. Small farms might have one or two slaves and helped in the farming and were considered part of the family, and they were usually Italian. The chief source of slavery were prisoners of war, followed by piracy. Pompey and Caesar made a fortune in the slave trade. The rich owned most in the best, and the Greeks were the highest in demand. Businessmen used them as shop assistants, worked in the Latifinina's largest landed estates in pitiful conditions, and Cato argued it was cheaper to work them to death than to replace them, than to take care of them. Estimates from one quarter to half of the free population were slaves. There would be a rebellion in Sicily, and slaves were branded and beaten, ill-fed, cleaned, and housed in underground prisons. It took three years to crush the 70,000 slave revolt, 135 to 132, and again in 104 to 104, 1 BC, which took the whole island of 17,000 legionnaires to stop. The greatest of all the rebellions was the Spartacus Rebellion. In 71 BC, when 70,000 of them, under the leadership of Spartacus, held the councils in Rome at bay for over one year, Finally, Spartacus is going to be killed in battle, and 6,000 of his followers are going to be captured and crucified along the Apennine Way leading into Rome. Pompey would actually take credit for the defeat of Spartacus, but it was actually Crassus who had crushed the slave uprising. The Evolution of Roman Law the Twelve Tables were still memorized by schoolboys in the first century BC. Civil law, Ius Civile, derived from the Twelve Tablets. 
The praetor, when taking an office, would issue an edict listing his guidelines for dealing with the different kinds of legal cases. What if there was a dispute between a Roman and a non-Roman? Well, the laws of the nations, the us gentium, that part of the law that applies to both Romans and to foreigners. Natural law, ius naturale, through the influence of Stoicism, created the universal divine law, thus giving Roman jurists a philosophical justification, systemizing Roman law according to the basic principles. From the time of the Twelve Tables until Justinian's codification of Roman law in the 6th century AD was added, to and corrected by the Roman praetors. And this is why this is one of the greatest contributions to Western history is the evolution of Roman law. The Romans adopted the Hellenistic style of art. There were statues that were displayed magnificently in the homes and public places. Romans produced a lot of the Greek statue, and that's why we see a lot of these statues from ancient times. They are not original Greeks. Their copies of the Rome, such as Venus de Milo. These statues were in high demand, and the most popular was the portrait sculpture. So we actually know exactly what a lot of these important Roman citizens and people actually looked like. Rome's greatest contribution in the arts was in the field of architecture. The Romans built aqueducts. These are structures that you see in the picture before you that would carry water into the Roman cities. They were also masters of building highways and Roman roads. When the greatest invention was concrete, and the use of concrete, and along with the arch, allowed the Romans to build even higher, like the aqueducts and later on the Colosseum. And other great contributions will be also the public bath. The public bath. Here we see an example of what would take place in the public bath. First, you had the hot spa room. The spa's heat and steam made bathers sweat, ridding them of dirt and pores of their skin. Then came the steam bath. Furnaces boiled pools of water to fill the hot room with steam. Then came the war room. Before entering the hot room, bathers went into the warm room to get used to the heat. And then they finally went to the cold room, where bathers would go into the cold room last of all, where they did a cold plunge into the icy pool. That'll definitely wake you up in the morning. There was also exercise and gaming before going home, and bathers liked to sunbathe and chat with their friends. Some also did athletic exercises. Body hair was seen as really repulsive for the Romans, and seen sometimes at the Roman baths, except for the hair on the top of their head, all hair was shaved off of their body. Values and attitudes. Most Morium was a very conservative to maintain the traditions of their ancestors, parental authority above all, the loyalty to the state. The Pietas was the dutiful execution of one's obligation to one's fellow citizen, the gods and the state. The creation of an empire began to weaken the value system. Greater emphasis on affluence, status, and material possessions seemed more important. Individualism is for the good of the all. And so the Romans began to look for answers. Was it because of the destruction of Carthage? There was no more threats for them to be worried about. Overwhelmed by the affluence of the empire that it created, the Greek and the ideals, Roman Praetor Council and Censor in 184 BC a member of the ruling class, Cato scorned the Greeklings, those who followed the Greek way of life. But yet he was a hypocrite who knew Greek and had his son study in Athens because he knew that was the way of the world. Scipio Emilianos, the conqueror of Carthage, cried when it burned, saying, This is the glorious moment, but I am seized with the foreboding that someday the same fate will befall my country. Roman generals and patricians were more open to the Greeks, and he saw Rome as becoming a center of the world. He admired Greek philosophy and literature, and organized a group of intellectuals dedicated to Greek thought. Now we look at the decline and the fall of the Roman Republic, which is going to take almost a hundred years. More specifically, certain factors contributed to the instability of the Roman government. 
including the rule by the nobiles, the upper patrician and plebeian classes united by marriage, and the concentration of power in a few aristocratic families. For example, 80% of the councils, B3, 3, 233 and 133 BC, came only from 26 Roman families, as well as the conflicts among leading political groups, the Optimates, the Populars, and the Equates. Social and economic changes, such as the decline of the small farmer due to his extended military service, and severe damage from these farms endured during the Punic Wars, as well as the most importantly, the development of large estates, the latifundia, of cash crops tended by slaves and tenant farmers, all fostered the movement of unstable agrarian masses to the cities. The Optimates and Populars. The Optimates, the best men, controlled the Senate and wished to maintain their oligarchical privileges. The Populars favored the people, and they were aristocrats who used the other people's assemblies in Council of the Plebs to break the domination of the Optimates. The Optimates and Populars were political groups from the aristocratic class of Rome in the late Republic. The Equate, or the Equestrians, they once formed Rome's cavalry and became wealthy through a variety of means as the empire grew. The Senate would pass a law in 218 BC that no senator can deal in contracts, such as shipbuilding, outfitting, and army. This kept the equestrians from entering office. Changes in the army. Land devastated by the Second Punic Wars, military service increased from two to six years. The army was never meant for distant wars. And when they returned, they found their land destroyed and sold out. The Latifadians increased in size over cash crops, wines, olives, and wool. And the number of men declined due to that only those who had economic state could be in the army. So they left for the cities to find work and grew discontented. The social and economic changes, such as the decline of the small farmer due to his extended military service and the severe damage these farms endured in the Punic Wars, as well as the most importantly the development of the large estates, uh, cash crops tended by slaves and tenant, foster, tenant farmers, all fostered the movement of unstable agrarian masses to the cities. The reforms of Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus. These examples of exploitation of the poor farmers led to the Gracchi brothers, Tiberius and Gaius, to come to their aid of those helpless souls and assist them in their survival against the senatorial aristocracy. In 133 BC, Tiberius was elected tribune and he proposed a law limiting land holdings by one individual to 310 lakers, and with any access to be leased to the poor farmers at a nominal rent. Before this law was enacted, Tiberius' term expired. Subsequently, he ran for re-election as tribune, which was against the constitutional term of office for one year. The Roman senators used this as an excuse for violence, which resulted in the slaughter of Tiberius and 300 of his followers. Nine years later, Tiberius' brother Gaius was elected tribune in 123 BC. He pushed through a series of laws to weaken the Senate. He had a law enacted that provided for a monthly distribution of grain to the people for one half the market price. He also attacked the powers of the Senate and was defeated for re-election in 121 BC. The government accused him of being an enemy of the state. However, Gaius refused to stand trial. His followers were routed by the Senate and Gaius, sensing the end, persuaded a slave to end his life. After that, 3,000 3, of his supporters were condemned to death. This opened the door to more violent and weakening of the Republic. And we like to think that our politics are really tough. Marius and the New Roman Army. In 111 BC, a series of uprisings occurred on the Roman frontiers. The first of these was a struggle of the Jugurtha, the king of Numidia in North Africa followed by a campaign against the Gauls in a war involving Mithridates and Pontus. The unrest created the stage for a popular Roman leader from peasant stock, Gaius Marius, who had made his fortune as a government contractor, collecting taxes to enter the pages of history. 
Marius served with the distinction in the Jugurthian War and brought the leader Jugurtha in chains to Rome, where the unfortunate man eventually died of starvation in prison. Meanwhile, the Gauls from the Baltic, Cimbri and Tunonis, invaded Transplan Gaul and defeated the Roman army. Again, Rome turned to Marius for military leadership, this time against the Gauls. He did not fail. Marius and his army defeated and massacred the Teutons near Marseille, France, and the Cimbri in the Po Valley near Vercellus. Under Marius's direction, the Roman army underwent some personal and structural reorganization. He now equipped his army soldiers equally, whether rich or poor. The size of a legion was increased to 6,000 men and divided into 10 cohorts of 600 men each. The army service was now mostly voluntary and the soldiers gave their loyalty only to their commander and his ability to pay, promote, and discharge. After defeating the Gauls, Marius returned to Rome a hero and was awarded another consulship. The man selected to replace him was Lucius Cornelius Sulla, who had served as quaestor under Marius in the Jugarthian War, and later against the Cimbri, had demonstrated his fighting skills. As a result of his success, he served as praetor and held a position in Cilicia and Asia Minor, where he enriched himself taxing the provincials. The Role of Sulla in the Social War The Social War gave Sulla further opportunities to enhance his reputation. The Social War was the result of a long brewing bitterness between Rome and her Italian allies on the peninsula. Many of these Italians had been granted citizenship by Marius and on the battlefield, a program not enthusiastically embraced by the leaders of the Roman Senate. In fact, they tried to turn the Roman populace against Marius, and in doing so, alienated the Italians and convinced them that the Roman Senate as a whole could not be trusted. Riots erupted, and eventually all non-citizens were expelled from Rome. Drusus, the son of a tribune, was elected tribune in 91 BC and began reforms by proposing the Lex de Civitat, aimed at extending citizenship to all of Rome's Italian allies. Unfortunately, he was murdered before a vote could be taken. Out of frustration, the allies severed the relationship with Rome and created a federal state of their own, which they called Italia. With an army close to 100,000 men, Italia went into full rebellion. Rome, at this time, did not have a large standing army, but did have a good geographical location. Adequate seaports, better agricultural lands than Italia, as well as the extensive road system and fortified towns. Because of these advantages, the rebellion was crushed, but not before Rome granted the rebels what they had sought, fought for all along, Roman citizenship. Finally, nearly all the inhabitants of the Italian peninsula had the same rights as the citizens of Rome. However, they still could not vote nor hold offices unless they came to the capital city in person. For his victory against Italia, Sola was promoted to the rank of general and further rewarded with a consulship. But again, he faced war, this time against Mithrates, king of Pontus, who had conquered Asia Minor and then advanced into the Roman province of Asia. The inhabitants of the region hailed Mithrates as a liberator from the Romans, and with the king's assent, massacred all the Romans and Italians in the region. Historians have estimated that some 80,000 were butchered in one day alone. Mithrates then invaded Greece and captured Athens. Sola attacked and retook Athens and won a historic battle at Coronea, where he was outnumbered five to one. Mithrates surrendered, paid an indemnity, and retired to Pontus. This mercurial rise of Sola caused a rivalry with Marius that resulted in an attempt to deprive Sola of his command, which he refused, marched on Rome, and drove Marius and his followers from the city wall. Marius was declared an outlaw, forcing him to go into Africa exile in 88 BC. He returned the following year, raised an army, joined the consul Cinna, and moved against Rome. When Marius and his troops entered the city, he had the gates closed and started the execution of his enemies, with nearly all the aristocratic party perishing in the massacre. 
Then Marius was elected consul for the seventh time, but he did not live long enough to enjoy the full consulship term. He died at the age of 70 before he could meet Sola on the battlefield in the east. Sola returned to Rome from his victory over Mithrates to more turmoil and subsequently was appointed dictator in 82 BC for an unlimited term. Over the next three years, Sola exterminated his opponents, restored to the Senate its original powers, even the Senate's vote veto acts over the assembly and curtailed the powers of the tribunes. Then, Sola retired in 80 BC to a life of luxury on his estate in Campia and died a few months later. The Death of the Republic All this barbaric violence and reign of terror, principally Sola's liability, did little to restore the old republic and in fact probably contributed more to its ruination. Following the seemingly endless internal turmoil and strife, a new bigoted and selfish aristocracy emerged as leaders of Rome. Among the more infamous are such personalities as Pompey, Crassus, and last but not least, Julius Caesar. It must be said that for a time they attempted to work together to control the Roman government, but event inevitably they became rivals. Pompey won fame as the conqueror of Syria and Palestine, while Caesar devoted his attention to the Gauls, adding territories to the state, what is now Belgium and France, and finally Crassus, who won his reputation fighting against Spartacus in the slave revolt. In 60 BC, the three men formed the first triumvirate to control Rome and were given military commands abroad, Pompey in Spain, Crassus in Syria, and Caesar in Gaul. At the Battle of Korea in 53 BC against the Parthians, Crassus was killed, thus dissolving the triumvirate. Pompey the Great The following year, there was a series of mob disorders, and the Senate turned to Pompey and elected him sole consul. Meanwhile, Caesar was confronted with a revolt of the Gauls, and after five years of campaigning and an estimated two million Gaelic lives lost, he returned to Rome. Pompey, now sole consul of Rome, feared Caesar's supposed aim for despotic power and labeled him an enemy of the state. Interesting enough, Pompey had married Caesar's daughter to kind of solidify their alliance, but then his daughter died during childbirth. Pompey was given military command to clear the Mediterranean Sea of pirates, in which he succeeded. He put in charge of this campaign against Mithrates. He wanted to take advantage of Rome's internal troubles. Pompey defeated Mithrates, won prestige and wealth through his victory. He returns to Rome and disbands his army in hopes that the Senate will reward him and his army with the Eastern settlement. Marcus Tullius Cicero A form of the equestrian order and first of his family to achieve consulship, he presented Novos Homo, the new man of the equestrian order. He made his name for himself as a lawyer, and he was a brilliant orator. He was elected to consul in 63 BC, and he advocated a balanced government of monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. In the concord of orders, the cooperation between the equestrians and the Senate, dotting on the good old days, when everyone worked together, collective rule for the good of the Roman state. Cicero looks to Pompey to make the concord of orders a reality and the Senate saw Pompey as too powerful and denied his wishes. The struggle between Pompey and Caesar. Caesar was confronted with the revolt of the Gauls and was sent by Pompey and Crassus to get rid of him because they feared he was growing in power. After five years of campaigning and estimated two million Gaelic lives lost, he returned to Rome. Pompey, now sole consul of Rome, feared Caesar's supposed aim for despotic power and labeled him an enemy of the state. Now Caesar had learned well from Marius, Sulla, and Pompey that the road to power was through his military command and a devoted army. With his military fame established and having conquered by Gaul by 50 BC, and with his writing and recording to the events of the, his commentaries on the Gallic War, was well known and idolized by the people of Rome. 
This map, of course, depicts the victories that Caesar achieved in defeating the Gauls and also adding what is today modern France, and he even entered Britannia to the Roman Republic. Crossing the Rubicon River, the die has been cast. In 49 BC, Caesar made his bid to rule Rome. Upon his return from Gaul, he defied the orders of Senate that declared that he should come and stand trial for treason and crossed the Rubicon River with his loyal army, the 13th Legion, and set out to defeat Pompey, his son-in-law and former ally. Crossing the Rubicon will become a lexicon in our language, meaning that there's no turning back. Caesar would say that the die has been cast, knowing that the end result would be civil war. Caesar drove Pompey from Italy. Pompey had fled to Greece, and the Battle of Pharsalus would end the wars of the First Triumvirate and left Caesar supreme commander of the Roman world. Pompey then fled from Pharsalus to Egypt, where he was assassinated on the order of the pharaoh Ptolemy XIII, who had cut off his head and preserved it in brine for a gift for Caesar. Caesar remained for the season in Egypt and in the court of Cleopatra, and supposedly fathered a son with her. This seems questionable since he had previously only fathered one child with three women. Following his stay in Egypt, Caesar returned to Spain for his last battle at Munda against the Roman Republican leaders. And backed by his army, Caesar was given every conceivable political power by the Senate, making him the undisputed master of the Roman Senate. In 46 BC, he became dictator for 10 years, and a year later, for life. He was also consul, tribune, censor, and supreme pontiff. Additionally, the Senate granted him full authority to declare war and make peace, as well as to control state revenues. Effectively, Rome was no longer a republic, because as dictator for life, Caesar was now above the law. He had taken the concept of political power far beyond anything his predecessors may only have dreamed about, and he had support of the masses who had simply become exhausted by constant anarchy. Nevertheless, under the leadership of Brutus and Cassius, representing the old aristocracy, and the fear of the return to the monarchy, Caesar would be assassinated on March 15, 44 BC. Regardless of Caesar's despotic inclinations, what constructive policies can we attribute to him in his relatively short term as an absolute supreme ruler of Rome? It's interesting to note that Brutus and Cassius thought by killing Caesar, they would save the Republic. But in fact, the knives that were driven into Caesar only finally finished off the Republic. The following list may shed some light on this question. He replaced the Egyptian solar calendar with the Julian one of 365 days a year and a leap year every fourth year. It is a calendar we still use today with a slight reform by Pope Gregory the 13th in 1582. He granted self-government to more towns in Italy. He strove to limit the number of slaves because they were creating unemployment among free men. He investigated extravagance in the distribution of public grain and reduced the number of recipients by more than 50%. He made plans to codify the laws and increase the penalty for criminal offenses. He confirmed citizenship on thousands of calls and Spaniards and helped to eliminate distinction between Italians and provincials. He appointed non-Italians in the Senate, increased membership to 900. He enlisted non-Italians in the legions, and he settled veterans and urban poor on unused land, and he introduced public works and reduced the relief rolls, and he ordered the proprietors of the Letofenida to employ one free person to every two slaves. Final word on Julius Caesar. Caesar's reforms apparently benevolent and undoubtedly helped the less fortunate, regardless his despotic policy subverted and violated the institutions of the Republic. For example, he ended the checks and balances among the assemblies and officials. He had forced the Senate to adopt his proposals without discussion 
and he planned to be worshipped as a god, much like Alexander the Great. And finally, he did not reduce the most glaring inequities in the distribution of wealth, nor enlarge the political rights of the discontented masses. Despite all his obvious shortcomings, Caesar still appears to be an enigma, even today. Are we still blinded by hero worship, or do we believe that man makes history, and not history makes the man? Did Rome need a rule of force of a Caesar, or did it need to correct economic and political inequities instead? Or do we base our estimation of Caesar on speculation of what he might have accomplished for Rome had he lived? His statesmanship and political aspirations may be questionable, but his conquering of Gaul and his overrunning of the Mediterranean from 49 to 45 BC leave little doubts as to his military talents and prowess as an exceptional leadership and ability as a general. The final struggle, Octavian versus Antony. Caesar's assassins did not replace the Republic or restore liberty. Instead, they laid the foundation for Mark Antony's attempt to seize control of Rome and he promptly sent Caesar's legions to the provinces for safekeeping where they posed a threat to him or Rome, but he was not, but we're getting ahead of the story. In the summer of 44 BC, Rome expectantly waited the arrival of Caesar's legal heir from Illyria. He had hoped his adopted son, 18 year old and great nephew, Octavian. And Octavian was received enthusiastically by the populace, but Anthony refused to take him seriously because he was just a young kid. Regardless, Octavian began to win public support and raised a private army, consisting mostly of Caesar's veterans. In February of 43 BC, Cicero persuaded the Senate to declare war on Antony. The two consuls and their troops, accompanied by Octavian and his legions, defeated Antony at Muta, and the other, with both consuls losing their lives in the battle. Anthony retreated across the Alps, where he met the army of Lepidus, advancing from Spain. The two armies were old veterans and refused to fight each other. Finally, the two forces convened, convinced Lepidus and Antony to unite. In the meantime, Octavian, with the aid of his army, had been elected consul to fill out the remainder of the year of the two consuls killed at the action of Mutina. Octavian, Antony, and Lepidus finally realized they needed to cooperate and thus formed the second triumvirate in October 43 BC. This political alliance ruled Rome for 10 years and divided the provinces with Antony and Lepidus receiving the lion's share. At the same time, they rid themselves of their enemies, 300 senators and 2000 equestrians, including Cicero, and confiscated their lands for distribution to their veteran soldiers. Furthermore, Marriage was used to seal their bond, with Octavian marrying Clodia, stepdaughter of Antony. The Death of the Republic and the Rise of the Emperors Before the end of the Triumvirate's first year in power, Antony and Octavian sailed for Greece with 28 legions to face Brutus and Cassius. They had met at Philippi in eastern Macedonia in October 42 BC. The first battle found Antony victorious over Cassius, who subsequently committed suicide. Three weeks later, Brutus fought the combined armies, but was also defeated and killed himself. Octavian and Antony returned to Italy with their armies, refusing to fight each other and exacting a reconciliation. Again, the Roman provinces were redistributed. Octavian received Illyria and Western Europe, while Antony took the east and Lepidus retaining Africa. Antony married Octavian's sister-in-law, Octavia, and left for the east. Shortly thereafter, Octavian destroyed Sextus Pompey and his pirates, and expelled Lepidus from the triumvirate and took the province of Africa for himself. Antony and Cleopatra by the time Antony arrived in the east in 41 BC, he found the region had long been looted by Pompey in 63 BC, Crassus in 53 BC, and Brutus and Cassius in 43 BC. The cupboard was bare, with little left to plunder. As a result, he turned to the riches of Egypt. He had a relationship with Cleopatra and fathered children by her. He suffered a defeat by the Parthians and then 
married Cleopatra in 37 BC. This was illegal since he was still officially married to Octavia. Subsequently, Antony declared Caesarian, Cleopatra's son and Caesar's son, the legitimate heir in Rome, which mounted to branding Octavian as usurper. In 32 BC, Octavian declared war on Cleopatra and Antony, who moved their army into Greece that same year. Octavian brought an equally large army and navy in 31 BC. At the famous Battle of Actium, Octavian outflanked Antony's navy, while Antony's troops mutinied because they hated Cleopatra and joined Octavian's forces. In the summer of 30 BC, Octavian entered Egypt without resistance. Antony committed suicide. Cleopatra negotiated with Octavian, but in the end also committed suicide. Finally, Octavian seized Egypt and was now the master of the Mediterranean world. In the map that we see, titled the Roman Domain in the Late Republic of 31 BC, also will begin the first year of the Roman Empire and the beginning of the rule of Octavian, who will hence become known as Augustus Caesar. And so ends our study of the Republic of Rome.